we're playing in the hockey arena, it sometimes could be compared to like human pinball. And it was a higher scoring game than the traditional outdoor soccer. And it was a, perhaps a better TV sport in, you know, in our eyes that it was going to catch on pretty quickly. And playing with this orange and black ball with a different set of rules, uh, the, the nonstop substitutions, uh, and, you know, it was catching on, but we weren't selling tickets at the prices to really function as a profitable business. So there were just too many times when you had to dress the house or constantly reduce uh, ticket prices, you know, with groups. And um, it, it was a real challenge. I mean, you know, you, you really got nervous. And, you know, I got to work in the New York market, but, you know, some of these secondary areas were starting to take off. I mean, you go to St. Louis or Kansas City, and they were talking sellouts as the league started to grow. So in the markets where you weren't competing with a New York or a Washington Redskins kind of thing, um, you could be pretty successful because you were kind of the only game in town. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Ah, yes, it's that time again, friends. Hi, Tim Hanlon here. How are you? Thanks for joining me, and it's Good Seats Still Available, as announced, uh, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. We are uh, often uh, accused, and uh, and uh, rightly so, for uh, spending quite a bit of time here on this podcast, at least in our early weeks, uh, around uh, professional soccer, uh, arguably the uh, uh, one of the key reasons for starting this uh, little show, and um, uh, we are guilty as charged, and we admit it. Uh, but we have spent most of our time right uh, until now uh, focused on uh, NASL, outdoor soccer uh, exploits. Um, we really haven't touched on uh, a, an equally, and in many respects, even more fascinating league uh, called the MISL, or the Major Indoor Soccer League, at least the original version of it that uh, ran from uh, roughly 1978 to, I guess, the early 90s or so. And uh, for a good part of the latter part of the decade of the 80s, uh, was the top tier professional soccer uh, league uh, in the United States. And um, uh, in, in many respects, I think uh, uh, not only kept the sport alive, but uh, frankly, doesn't get a whole lot of credit for uh, for doing so. And obviously, we know what the, the state of the sport is today uh, because of those efforts. Uh, our guest today is a guy named Michael Menchel, uh, who uh, with PR and uh, operations management, general management uh, roles, uh, in a whole bunch of uh, teams in the old MISL, had a front row seat to a lot of the uh, fun, the frivolity, the, uh, in some cases, shenanigans uh, around this um, very interesting and innovative and disruptive league. Uh, and uh, from a fan's perspective, was uh, just a, a white hot comet, uh, not just in Kansas City, wink, wink, nod, nod, uh, of, uh, of fun and uh, excitement and action uh, and it's uh, something we're going to start our uh, MISL uh, explorations with uh, today with Michael in our conversation uh, in a couple of seconds. I think uh, if you remember teams like the uh, New York Arrows, the Baltimore Blast, uh, yeah, even if you remember the Hartford Hellions, um, this is the uh, podcast for you. But uh, we'll also, uh, fear not, uh, also uh, touch on uh, some old NASL memories with the Colorado Caribous that one year uh, wonder of 1978, where Michael got his uh, pro soccer start. And uh, your football fans uh, should stick around as well, because Michael's journeys also took him, uh, after actually starting in the NFL, and we'll talk about that with the Washington Redskins, to the St. Louis football Cardinals uh, back in the day as well. So you should, uh, all uh, all of you fans of those teams and more, uh, will likely uh, enjoy our conversation with Michael Menchel uh, in just a couple of seconds. Before we get to Michael and our chat, uh, I again want to remind you that Audible is our uh, sponsor of this episode and for numerous uh, episodes thus far. And we thank them uh, for doing so. And we also thank you, hopefully, for trying them out. Uh, if you want a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial of Audible's audiobook service, uh, which you know has over 180,000 titles to choose from, uh, that being, of the, being the premier provider of digital audiobooks, Audible is, um, that plays on just about any uh, device you can think of, iPhone or Kindle or Android or any other 500 plus devices. Um, Audible is yours for the free trying at 
audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, that's a free trial, 30 days in length, as well as a free audiobook download if you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, it is a fine service. I love it to death. Uh, I listen to books all the time, and Audible is the awesome way to do so. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Give it a try. You'll find great stuff in nonfiction and fiction. You name the genre, they pr pretty much have it. Uh, and uh, again, you can cancel at any time. Uh, and it's worth, I think, at the very least for trying out a free audiobook download by going to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Uh, I trust that you will enjoy it as much as I do. Okay. Promotional messaging out of the way. Let's get to our conversation with the very interesting Michael Menchel here on the podcast. So maybe we can sort of start near the beginning. Um, uh, you, you're, it seems to me that your first sort of a taste of uh, professional uh, soccer uh, heartache and joy uh, was uh, in 78 with the Caribou of Colorado. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe before we even get there, what was your life like at the time before you got there? And more interestingly, how did you get to how did you jump in, I guess? Okay. Um, I went to college in Washington, D.C. I went to American University, and I went primarily to play soccer. And um, in my, I studied communications. So in my junior year, I was lucky enough to get an internship at the local ABC affiliate. And I was basically a weekend copy boy and kind of worked my way up to weekday copy boy while I was in school and uh, got hired by the TV station uh, when I graduated uh, in 74. So um, I asked the sports guy, because like yourself, I'm a sports nut. I said, I'd like to go out to Redskin Park someday. And he says, well, it's very hard to get there. It's like the White House. You know, they don't let you. I said, I'm just throwing it out there if a situation ever comes up. And like two or three weeks later, he said, um, George Allen said, you can come out and meet you. So I said, cool. So I put on the one suit I had in college and tie and kind of buffed up my Afro hairdo and went out there. And it was like a fortress. First of all, it was a long way out. It was by Dulles Airport. And from Washington, D.C., I kept saying, gosh, that's a long way for sportscasters to go just to do, you know, a three-minute piece. So um, all the players were out there. That I never saw an AstroTurf football field in person. It was pretty cool having uh, natural grass and artificial turf side by side and everybody in their perfect uniforms. And all of a sudden, this head coach comes jogging out and um, the sports director introduces to me, him to me, and I know it's like six minutes before practice is supposed to start. And uh, we start talking, give him a firm handshake, and uh, he said, do you ever think of getting into public relations? And I said, yes, that would be great. He says, well, there's an opening uh, for a PR assistant with the Redskins because the previous guy went to the World Football League. And okay, shook his hand. He said, I'd like you to write down 10 things you can do to help the Redskins win uh, and send it to me. Okay. Shook hands again. And, you know, they started practice. We had to leave the area. They put the blinds down in the PR office. It's a closed practice. I go back in the, the car with the sports guy and um, just wrote down 10 things. And frankly, some of the things I said were, I don't know the difference between the guard and the tackle. I'm a New York Giants fan. And um, uh, he apparently liked what I wrote. He invited me back for an interview, uh, being a little more of the geekish, prepared type. I read his book, uh, which wasn't very good, but I read it, and I came to the interview and one or two occasions quoted something from his book, and he seemed to like that, and um, hired me. And um, I was, like, flipped out. And uh, I never met the PR director. And my first day on the job, there's Joe Blair, who is a senior PR person. And he'd been there many years. And after some time, I realized that he was going to spend the rest of his life as the head PR guy. And I said, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm going to be the backup. But, boy, I'm in the NFL, and I'm going to learn some fun stuff. And um, basically, eight, nine months later, um, I'm at um, – my grandmother's place in Florida for spring break time of year, uh, my first vacation. And I remember vividly 
my grandmother in a Eastern European German accent says, uh, in the afternoon, I got like too much sun the first day and she's overfeeding me. And she says, Tatala, Alan's on the phone from Washington. And I'm going, Alan, Alan, I'm thinking first name Alan, I have no idea who it is. And it was George Allen. And he says, Mike, uh, that bastard Joe Blair, he, he went to work for Ed Garvey in the Players Association. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, I had no inkling that he was being recruited. And a very loyal guy, Joe Blair, and really took me under his wing. And he said, get on the first plane back and don't tell anybody why you're coming back. So I mentioned to my grandmother that I was leaving right now. And there was a 5.30 flight from Miami to Washington Reagan, Washington National then. And she thought I got fired. And uh, I got back, my roommate in Rockville, Maryland, why are you back so early? And that, I can't tell you. Went to Redskins Park the next day, which is a 35-mile drive from my apartment. And my assistant, Diane, is there. And she goes, what are you doing back? Can't tell you. And I walk in and... George Allen says, uh, it's either you or Jack Zane from the University of Maryland. And I'm kind of like, well, that guy's got a lot more experience than me and is very well regarded. Um, and a few minutes later, he says, you got the job. And he hands me a two-year contract. And it was like rubber stamped by Pete Rosell. And it was like some kind of official NFL contract. And, you know, I'm 21 and a half years old. I'm not going to turn it down, <laughs> and I'm ecstatic. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in Joe Blair's chair at his pretty desk overlooking the field. And um, that's how I got into professional sports. All right, so at that point, though, it seems like you kind of had your uh, your gold ticket then, right? So uh, how did the – and, and for, for those listeners who have never lived in the D.C. area, I went to undergrad myself in, in the D.C. area, worked there for a little while in, in TV news, and – uh, you know, Redskins fever is it, that's not even the right word to describe it. I mean, especially at that time, right, where it's kind of really You're exactly the, right, yeah. because at that time, the caps, I'm a season ticket hold to the caps and the bullets were really second tier citizens in this community because everybody was diehard Redskins fans because of the history. The caps were new. The bullets had just moved from Baltimore pretty recently. And I um, I literally as I got going in the job, George Allen could announce to me that we signed three draft picks or signed three players. Instead of giving it to the media one shot, I could spread it out over three days and it would be most of the time the lead story. And, you know, unlike today's times, you really could have a lot to do with the way things were positioned and when it got out. And you did it when you wanted to do it. And it was absolutely fabulous. I, I, and I remember just going on my first trip as an advanced person. Um, I said, is this a mistake? This is a first class plane ticket. And she goes, oh, all department heads go first class. And I just freaked out. And I got to tell you something funny. We played the Cincinnati Bengals. So as a PR guy, I would go out on Tuesday for a Sunday game. And I go to the Bengals training camp, give a brief talk to the media, hand out videotapes, really an exciting job, hand out videotapes, give pictures to the two local daily newspapers, and maybe do a radio interview or meet with some radio people or set some things up. And I had a Bloody Mary because I was flying first class on this airplane in the morning. And all of a sudden, the announcer goes, uh, we're about to land in Covington, Kentucky. And I started freaking out. I got on the wrong plane, you know, and I wasn't on the wrong plane. When you're flying to the Cincinnati airport, it happens to be just over the river in Kentucky. <laughs> I think that's the last time I had a beverage of that kind when I was advancing a game. And um, I, I got to see a lot of the United States and I got to go ahead of the team and represent the Redskins. And it was absolutely a, a dream job. It really was. All right. So uh, give us uh, some insight then as to how you would uh, take that dream job and think that the uh, the dream would be even uh, further extended in uh, the fledgling sport of professional soccer circa 78 in Denver, Colorado, of all places. So um, 
Um, I've always loved soccer. As I said in my little thing with George Allen that, you know, I didn't know a guard from a tackle. And, and working for the NFL, it's kind of a lifetime job. And um, I got approached by two men, uh, Dan Wood and uh, Dave, I forgot his last name. Uh, would this Dave be the Dave. coach, Dave Clements? Dave Clements. Yep. Yes, thank you. And um, they said, would you be interested in coming to Colorado? And, you know, I know how beautiful Colorado is. And I met them at the Twin Bridges Marriott, which no longer exists. We had breakfast together. And um, I flew out to Denver very discreetly and was blown away by the Rocky Mountains by a new team owned by a rock star producer and a famous lumber company in the great Northwest and the chance to do something in Mile High Stadium um, and even an increase in salary. So um, I'd been at the Redskins for about four years, and it was great, and uh, my contract was coming up anyway, and um, I just decided to part ways. And, you know, some of my friends thought I was crazy, but, you know, loving soccer, I took the opportunity and um, moved to Colorado and bought a townhouse and started working for the team as director of operations. Um, the only problem was, was a big one. The attendance was really hurting. You know, it was Orange Crush fans. It was Denver Broncos. And uh, it was really a tough sell because it was a small um, soccer market at that time and a huge stadium to fill. If we were in a smaller 20,000 seat, you know, uh, facility, it would look a lot better and be more soccer fan friendly. So um, I stayed there. And um, all of a sudden, the, the team is moving to Atlanta. Uh, it was a purchase. And I was uh, engaged to a woman whose former lived in Atlanta. And she said she didn't want to go there. And I said, okay. And uh, sold my townhouse. And um, a man named um, Bernie Roden called me up and said, uh, they're starting this indoor soccer league um, and we're going to get the New York franchise and can I hire you as a consultant to come to the first league meeting? I went to the league meeting and there were six teams, six owners and um, the, the, the big name was Pete Rose, was uh, an owner of the Cincinnati Kids and um, um, I was really intrigued by being part of a new league and Earl Foreman was the commissioner. And even though, uh, there were a lot of rookies in the room, it was exciting to be part of launching of a, a new league. And the, uh, gentleman, Bernie Roden introduced it to his partner, John Luciani. And I, uh, became general manager of the New York team. And our, you know, four or five months later, our first game was against the Cincinnati kids. And um, Pete Rose was uh, the name owner, and um, we are putting literally where the New York Islanders played, we're putting AstroTurf product right on top of the ice for the first time. It took, came from Georgia. It was really a, an 11th hour production, getting this ready. And I remember walking on it saying, oh, it's so cold, and there's some seams here. Someone could get hurt. And just prior to that, uh, the Cincinnati team wanted one of our players, a guy named Mario Garcia, I believe. And um, they said, what do you want for him? And I said, I'd like Pete Rose to kick out the first ball. And the general manager of the team said to me, is that all you want? I said, yes. So he said, sure. Never check with Pete Rose. He just told me, sure. And um, the opening game in the history of the league was the, uh, I have actually a framed picture of the uh, scoreboard at the end of the game of the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum, where um, Pete Rose, who then was thinking of going to the Philadelphia Phillies, showed up in a private plane in a leather jacket, collared shirt, casual slacks, and he kicked out the first ball, this orange and black ball, and it got the media, including the New York Times, to come out to Uniondale, New York, 
to the opening game of this Legend League. And uh, we unfortunately had a paper of the house because even though Long Island was a hotbed of recreation soccer, the ticket sales just weren't there, despite, you know, decent amount of print advertising. And um, it looked like quite an event for the opening day. And my team won the game, and Pete Rose kicked out the first ball, and we had a bunch of nice media coverage, uh, really good as Pete Rose, not so much from the Arrows. Uh, we uh, signed Shep Messing as a goalie, who was a big-name soccer person. And uh, the owner of the team had more to do with that than I because it was a, you know, quite a negotiation for a lot more money than anybody else in the league was playing, paying. And uh, well, so, that so, was my start. Yeah, so so much to unpack there. Um, but let, let me uh, – let's back up here for a second. So um, – uh, I actually, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, made a pilgrimage to uh, the sports uh, memorabilia store uh, that Pete Rose uh, literally spends about four or five days a week sitting and uh, signing autographs for, for six, 50, 60, 80 bucks pop, uh, wow. and uh, brought a, um, uh, a printout of, I think, what is now an iconic picture, uh, and I'd love to get a more, uh, I guess, quality or original version of it. Of Mr. Rose kicking out that first ball uh, at that first game. Uh, and in that picture, you see um, you see Earl Foreman, I think, on the right hand side. We'll post this on, on the site when, when this episode is up. Uh, and on the left, I think um, John Luciani is uh, is clapping. And then uh, there's the team sort of kind of in awe behind Rose kind of, you know, like they can't believe that this is happening kind of thing. And um, and, and I, I asked Rose about it. I said, you know, he was literally there was nobody there. Uh, the day I went, uh, this was around a conference I was at, and uh, yeah. I said, I got something for you here. And, he said, and I, I showed him the picture and he looked at it and he, he kind of fuzzily. Uh, and then he started to sort of pick out, I uh, said, soccer, he said, uh, Cincinnati, right? And then I think he might have mentioned one or two of the names like John Luciani, perhaps. Um, and uh, and then that was it. He really didn't. He didn't really sort of <laughs> he didn't regale me nearly with as much detail as you just did. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have a very good memory of all those minutia things from many years back. And, you know, it was just so exciting because it was the first game. And I remember some guy wrote an article, a guy named Don Marcus wrote an article for News, Newsday. And he talked about my clammy hands, you know, because I was so nervous of something going wrong, of a player tripping on the artificial turf as the game started. Or, frankly, we, we don't have enough turf to cover the hockey rink. You know, there were so many variables that, you know, you were nervous about. We, we practiced at a high school gym in Queens, and um, it was, you know, quite an undertaking, you know, with foreign players and the domestic players and, you know, visas. And I, I literally made more trips to immigration than you'd ever believe. Um, even the owner, uh, the, there were two owners of the team, Bernie Roden and John Luciani. And uh, Bernie Roden um, uh, kind of was the one who recruited me. And John Luciani was the front and center uh, high profile owner of the team and all he wanted to do was win a championship at whatever cost it you know took and you know we were able to sign a, uh, a few n talented foreign players that really helped us uh, especially in that first season well okay so um, again I'm going to back up a second so uh, you uh, the caribou of Colorado which by the way has its own sort of interesting stories right I mean we kind of glossed over the whole uh, uh, Jim Jeresh, uh, how do you say Jimmy Garcia. Like, Jimmy yeah. Garcia, right. Why? So obviously well-known, uh, uh, music producer. And if you ask the uh, band Chicago about their feelings about him, they may have, uh, not some fond memories, uh, of his management yeah. of their career. Um, and apparently the, I guess the Caribou Ranch, his, uh, his studio was really the inspiration to, uh, for the name of the team, right? That's yeah, correct. In fact, what, when I shared with you that, um, I was engaged to, this lady, um, he told me that I could have my honeymoon at the Caribou Ranch. And, you know, he had the players up there and, and the front office. And it was just a fabulous retreat, uh, maybe an hour from Denver. And it was just in the middle of nowhere. And the Chicago albums, many of them were produced right there. But it was a 
ongoing business where if you and I had a rock group and we wanted to cut an album, you would go there for a week or a month. And if you wanted lobster, if you wanted to go horseback riding, you wanted to get a certain movie back in those days, he took care of everything. His people had that place running and it was really isolated from the rest of the world. And um, it was just kind of a, a special place. But he wanted to bring his Hollywood friends to Mile High Stadium. I remember um, a couple times he brought some actors and the fact that Mile High Stadium was not filled up and he's in the owner's box, he was perturbed about it. And, you know, it created some tension. But, you know, the, 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 the indoor and outdoor soccer leagues, um, you know, had some challenges. Unless you were the Cosmos, um, you know, capacity was not something that, uh, you know, was something that you were able to fill up. All right, I, I don't. I don't want to spend. I don't want to dwell too much time on on, on Colorado because I do want to get to this MISL stuff because that that it has a whole realm of, of fascination uh, for me. But I, I do have to ask you about uh, two little things, I guess, in in that regard. Right. So we're talking about literally a one year wonder uh, in the NASL, and uh, uh, you you had somebody obviously in the music business. It seemed to me that that was around the time when um, you had a lot of people in the not only entertainment business, but specifically the music industry, uh, becoming somehow uh, fascinated and or dragged into this, I don't know, pixie dust of the, of the explosion, at least it, it perceived, of professional soccer at the time. Right? You had, uh, you know, Elton John with the uh, with the uh, L.A. Aztecs. You had uh, the um, consortium there in, uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia with the Fury. Uh, I'm wondering if there was any sort of, um, I don't know, inside club you know, musicians uh, uh, society, so to speak, that was kind of, you know, uh, wending its way through NASL ownership at the time, or was this just sort of a, a side thing that, um, no, you know, it was truly a side thing, you know, with the Erdogan's, you know, owning the cosmos, they were truly, you know, uh, humongous, you know, music producers, um, when they had Pele and, uh, you know, we're getting Canalia and getting 77,000 people to many of the, the home games at Giant Stadium. And frankly, for us in, in Denver, our whole season revolved not so much around Jimmy Garcia's friends coming or a bunch of rock stars coming to us. But when the Cosmos came with Pele, um, that's when we had a big crowd. That's when we had, you know, a post-game party that was you know, filled up a lot more than all the other games combined just because Pele, you know, was gracious enough to give some of his time before they jetted back to the East Coast. So uh, really it was the Cosmos coming for one game, and fortunately it was a home game, uh, was more important, it seemed, in the eyes of the owners and many of the fans than the whole season. Uh, and the, the players had these crazy uniforms um, with the with, uh, fraying around the uh, midriff and a, a really cool logo. And um, we had satin jackets when we traveled. I mean, these rock star jackets. And uh, unfortunately, I moved from one city to another with soccer, and it was in storage. And somehow through the moving company, it got ripped off. And that, of all the teams I've worked with, I think I've worked with seven teams, my famous my my favorite piece of memorabilia was that satin Carabooza Colorado jacket, wow. and I, it is no more. <laughs> and I had a jersey too that I uh, actually sent to Ted Howard in the North American Soccer League just as a you know a gesture of uh, some memorabilia to keep in what I hope would be a museum someday. Well, I, I think that uh, both of those items should be uh, when the national. Uh, uh, soccer Hall of Fame gets uh, reopened. I think it's late next year now in, in suburban Dallas near the uh, FC Dallas uh, uh, Stadium. Uh, I think both of those items in a Smithsonian like manner should be um, should be there because I, I agree that logo, the Caribou of Colorado logo uh, is is, I think, elegant and, and way ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, and I still have some programs and like yearbooks. Uh, my business card, you know, it, it, you know, I had a business card from the Redskins and from the, the St. Louis football Cardinals, but the business card from the Caribous of all the ones I've had was by far the most elegant, you know, it was just so beautifully done, even though we only drew, you know, five or 6,000 paid fans a game to mile high stadium in those days. 
Uh, all right, two two little nits, and then we'll move on. I promise. Uh, the, the 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 appellation of the team, right? So the official title was of the team was what? The Caribous of Colorado. Okay, and Caribous is 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 plural. Okay, so for wordsmiths out there, that's already I think a challenge or m- maybe even a, a question. Um, but but obviously it's known as Colorado Caribous, right? In terms of uh, programs and that kind of stuff. I mean, did that ever? I know it's a small knit, maybe a PR slash, you know, English major journalism thing. But did, did that ever trip you up at all because you've got this sort of formal name and this sort of informal name or did it not matter? No, it did not matter, actually. And <laughs> and, and people never really questioned it. Interesting. Um, it just kind of people accepted it. And, you know, we had trouble just, you know, getting two inches of copy after a game. <laughs> and, you know, the Denver Post or the Rocky Mountain News, because, you know, it was all about the Broncos and uh, uh, the Denver Nuggets. All right. So, so much for that theory. So I apologize to our listeners, but, you know, I, I try to I, I try to go through every little dark corner that I can. Sure. Uh, but, sure. But, but let's go back to that uniform for a second, because it is iconic for whatever reason. Um, uh, do you have any idea? So were you part of that that creation? How did that? Uh, how did you know? Det- OK. When how did that come about? And, and the who designed team, it? Yeah. It was already in in the production stage. So um, um I think I literally missed one or two games when the season started. So uh, I went aboard as director of operations and was trying to uh, enhance the public relations and travel to a number of games, you know, with the team. And um, um, I literally was given a furnished apartment, uh, promised a car, and my car happened to be a 12-passenger van and I literally, when the team would have a road game, they'd all gather at the office and they'd hop in my van and um, I'd drop the team off at the airport and drive around as a single man in his 20s with this commercial looking van in the Denver market. But, you know, my deal was that I got a car. It wasn't specified what it was, but I really was the hauler of uh, the players for many of the games. Do you, do you think Ursio's uh, troubles, I think at the time, I think the timing was about right with the band Chicago and the, I guess, the discovery of his, uh, uh, not uncommon for the music industry, but his uh, his financial dealings uh, with the band. Did, did, was that perhaps a reason why the team was ultimately sold to Atlanta? Because it seems like it was about the same time that those things came to light. Those yes. music issues. Yes, that was uh, certainly a catalyst in, in getting rid of the team. Uh, Because we had another faction of ownership that was uh, in the state of Washington. And uh, Jimmy Garcia was, you know, the one who was controlling it financially. Very interesting. Okay, so um, you mentioned so let's let's shift gears. You mentioned Bernie Roden, right? So he ostensibly is the guy that kind of um, pulls you into this uh, uh, new sort of uncharted uh, world of, of the major indoor soccer league. Um, yes. Did, were you besides it being a, a new league and obviously you, you've got soccer interest and background, um, but given your experiences in Colorado, right, not necessarily sort of gangbusters at the gate, et cetera. Um, was there any arched eyebrow as you sort of <laughs> decided to continue into soccer and yet now an unproven kind of environment? No, as a single guy and, and having some experience in professional football, I felt like you know, my experience could be an advantage. And I really enjoyed from an entrepreneurial point of view of let's find a practice facility. You know, who do we contact to get artificial turf? I mean, it was like kind of going in the yellow pages or just making a lot of phone calls by word of mouth. And it was really exciting to be, you know, a part of that. We signed Shep Messing and the owner says, uh, let, let's do a press conference at 21 in New York. I said, at 21, that's going to cost a fortune. Don't worry about it. You know, and we had no problem getting the media there because, frankly, it was the 21 club and <laughs> they got a free meal. And, uh, uh, you know, John wanted to win and John wanted the, the John Luciani wanted the media coverage. And, and that's what we did. In fact, when I moved from Denver to New York, um, it was pretty much a, a lateral salary move for me. And um, after one week, I realized you know, living in New York, which is where I'm from, was so much more expensive than Colorado. I walked into John's office and said, this may sound odd to you. I've only been here a few weeks, but I need a raise. And I give you my word, the cost of living has blown me away. And he gave it to me. 
<laughs> if he said no, I would have continued, of course. You know, I'm a person of my word. I'd signed a contract. But, you know, I just realized uh, foolishly that, you know, living in the New York market was a lot different than living in Denver in those days. All right. So how did you uh, so having grown up around that time in the New York metropolitan area myself, I had vivid memories of um, of seeing that sort of uh, light green uh, carpet uh, in my haze by babysitting for kids locally uh, in the middle, you know, late at night, I think on Channel 11 uh, tape delayed. Uh, I guess it was Terry Lewicki, Terry Lewicki and Kyle Rowe Jr. Yes, Kyle Rowe uh, Jr. Doing the games. And uh, I was just fascinated by this sort of, you know, um, and being a huge soccer fan of the outdoor cosmos, this sort of, uh, I don't know, this little party that seemed to be going on in the, in the, the wilds of Long Island. Um, how did, so uh, how, how did you tr- how did you successfully punch the arrows besides their quality of play, which obviously was very high for the first four years of the league? into the consciousness of New York metropolitan area sports fans? Well, you know, we're playing in the hockey arena. It sometimes could be compared to like human pinball. And it was a higher scoring game than the traditional outdoor soccer. And it was a, perhaps a better TV sport in, you know, in our eyes that it was going to catch on pretty quickly and playing with this orange and black ball with a different set of rules uh, the, the nonstop substitutions, uh, and you know, it was catching on, but we weren't selling tickets at the prices to really function as a profitable business. So there were just too many times when you had to dress the house or constantly reduce, uh, ticket prices, you know, with groups. And, um, it, it was a real challenge. I mean, you know, you, you really got nervous and you know, I got to work in the New York market, but you know, some of these secondary areas were starting to take off. I mean, you go to St. Louis or Kansas city and they were talking sellouts as the league started to grow. So in the markets where you weren't competing with a New York or a Washington Redskins kind of thing, um, you could be pretty successful cause you were kind of the only game in town. Um, and it's clear though, that, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the talent on the field, uh, obviously was extremely strong and, and, and dominating for, for the, those years. But I, this was also though, around the time the Islanders were kind of dominating the NHL. Did that, did that have any halo effect? No, it, it really didn't. Um, the Islanders had their loyal sold out season ticker base. And, you know, we shared the arena with them. And I remember the ticket manager would just kind of laugh because he didn't have much to do with the Islanders because the tickets were already, already sold before the season started. And th- we have the same ticket manager for the Islanders as we did for the New York Arrows. And he had a much more complicated job just, you know, giving it to, you know, the, 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 the soccer coach who's got 28 people coming in the logistics of meeting and getting this and that done, it just became a lot more complicated for him. But, um, uh, we had a lot of trouble. Um, we, we got media coverage, but it just wasn't paying off at the turnstile. Um, so let's talk about Bernie Roden for a second, if you know him, because, um, he seems to be the linchpin for some of your, uh, future uh, gigs in the MISL. But, um, uh, you know, I'm also really curious because you mentioned a little bit of time uh, in your background about uh, working with the Rochester Lancers, but and that's not by coincidence, right? That Rochester Lancers uh, job and or relationship with respect to the Arrows, right? Correct. And and just to go back a step, so um, one of the original teams was the Houston Summit Soccer, and John Luciani, Bernie's partner, his son owned the New York the Houston Summit Soccer. So in the second season of the Arrows, in, the, in December, I remember it was just cold and snowy in the New York area, as it is all the time in December. He said, would you consider uh, going to Houston? The man who's running that team uh, has done some things that we don't think are so honorable. And um, I said, sure. So literally, um, two days later, I'm on an airplane to Houston, Kenny Cooper, uh, was the coach. And, uh, I took over for this gentleman named Burl Cohen. And, um, literally they had someone drive my car down and gave me a furnished apartment. And I started working with Houston summit soccer with Kenny Cooper. 
and um, we had a, a very successful team on the field. But again, um, the joke around the Houston market was the three teams in town, the three sports that are most popular are high school soccer, college, uh, high school football, college football, and pro football. So soccer was really uh, way, way back there. And John Luciani's son ran the team. So I stayed there for one season working with Kenny Cooper. We won our division. We were runner-ups to the New York Arrows in the championship game. And it was very awkward for me. And, you know, walking around as a general manager, you know, I'd work for the other team and, you know, sign many of the players that were on the opposing team. But, you know, here I was wearing my Houston outfit, if you will, you know, hoping to topple them for the championship. All right. So I... And, I- yeah, I, I was at that championship game, as a matter of fact, in New York. Oh, you were? Yeah, strangely. Um, but so, then, can... so then Bernie said to me um, in his New York accent, Hey, kid, uh, you know, we have a, a, an ownership in the Rochester Lancers of the North American Soccer League. Now that the indoor season's over, would you consider coming up to Rochester and be the general manager of the team? So um, I flew up to Rochester with him from New York. And it was just a horrible day weather-wise. I met the other owners, and they were not impressive. I talked to some of the employees, and they were worried about their last paycheck. I asked if I could read the newspaper clippings of the previous year in town. And just there was a lot of negativity. And I said, um, um, I, they asked me to sit in this other room, and they had their board meeting, and they came out, congratulations. Uh, you're the general manager. We voted you in, unanimously. And I said, thank you, but I will decline the invitation. And I remember getting off the plane with Bernie, and I don't know if it was the Democrat and Chronicle or the Times Union, one of the two Rochester papers, actually had my picture on the front page of the newspaper, the front page, not the sports section, Menchel to be named Lancer's GM. <laughs> and I wish I had a copy of the newspaper still because it was, it was, you know, it was, it just totally caught me off guard. And having met the the local owners, I just didn't feel comfortable like it was going to be a good fit or a right career move for me. And I got on the plane with Bernie going back, and in his accent, I admire you, kid. Uh, turning down the thing, you know, I'm going to have something, you know, we'll keep you and you'll have something to do. And I admire you for turning them down in so many words. So it was, you know, a good feeling at least going back when I said, no, thank you. It was just a dreary day in Rochester and the offices were deplorable. And I just didn't think it was uh, an ownership group at a time I really wanted to get involved with. One of our previous guests, uh, Terry Hansen, uh, who uh, yeah. went on to the uh, Atlanta Chiefs, uh, interestingly, an interesting intersection. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, this was a couple of years probably before that period of time. And um, I think he was uh, referencing, I guess, sort of a, a I don't know if it's shady, but it's sort of a, a creative way uh, to run the franchise almost on a yearly basis where I guess the team was incorporated one year and then the next year it would incorporate separately and differently. And it just seemed to be yeah. sort of a comedy of, uh, but yeah, yeah, you had a franchise there that, um, you know, frankly, without it in the earlier part of the decade, um, perhaps might have, uh, helped ensure the, uh, the demise of the NASL because they're, you know, they were there in the thinnest of days. And I guess it just seems that the, that thinness continued, uh, as the NASL became more, uh, more yeah. popular. But it was really, uh, interesting for me having worked with both leagues because the New York owners said, Hey, let's loan our players to the Rochester Lancers where we have an ownership in. And I would do loan agreements between the major indoor soccer league and the North American soccer league and vice versa. And the North American soccer league office was not very happy with me, but you know, I had the approval of ownership to move players back and forth. And if a player was making $40,000 a year, you know, and you could divide it up between, you know, two markets with two different uh, teams, it it made sense financially. And, you know, we worked very hard to accomplish that. All right. So let's talk about that for a second, because that's a, that's a really interesting dynamic, right? So the fact that the NASL was not sort of, I guess, pleased at that, but that's that was also kind of a model that was going on in Houston too, right? With the hurricane? Yes. That's very, you're very... You did some good research because I actually forgot about that. Yes, we had um, 
financially it made sense to, you know, take the players. You didn't even have to fly them in. You know, they're, they're not doing anything in the off season, so to speak. I mean, outside of some conditioning. And most of them had a chance to make a little more money and play soccer at a nice level. So it was a win situation. And you also had fans who were familiar with the Hurricane players in the North American Soccer League who would come play in MISL. So Kenny Cooper, who was a goalie, our, our head coach, um, he played in Blackpool in his early years, but he was um, uh, he played in the North American Soccer League. So, you know, it was very easy for him, having a relationship with the local players and such, to bring some players over uh, across the street, so to speak. And we were very successful in terms of wins and losses, not as successful in terms of attendance. <laughs> yeah, that, that, in Houston in particular, on, on both sides of the aisle, it seemed. Um, yeah. Okay, so but the so I just want one last point on this. So the NASL not necessarily enamored with this sort of I guess shared player kind of uh, agreement. What about the MISL uh, management? Were they kind of okay with it? Yes, yes, they were fine because they wanted to upgrade the level of soccer. This helped keep costs down for the the owners that started the league. So it made a lot of sense. And the arrangement that the commissioner and deputy commissioner had, I don't know if you're aware of it, was that they were going to get uh, a franchise for free, each of them. If the league continued to grow, and let's say a franchise was worth $2 million, they could sell it to a group like yours in Chicago and take the $2 million and put it in their pocket or move to Chicago and be the ownership group of the team. Each of them was, as a reward for starting the league and putting everything together, was entitled to one franchise each. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I, so, But it's also interesting, too, because the tension, I mean, obviously the NASL uh, was at uh, its, arguably at Zenith with, uh, in 78, 79, you had, uh, you know, 24 teams, and at least on paper, it seemed like it was... Uh, uh, beyond fledgling at that time, you know, huge crowds in New York and Tampa and et cetera. Um, but it's obviously the the indoor game from the NASL perspective, right, was always this sort of dalliance until the yeah. arrival of the MISL, right? And this, yes. I guess this sharing of teams or this sort of renaming or, or co, co, I don't know, uh, 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 rostering, I guess, of these of the, the indoor and outdoor thing. Uh, I, I, you could see the NASL sort of... Um, uh, kind of cursing uh, themselves in that they kind of had the the whole indoor thing to themselves prior, but really didn't do much with it. And it took the MISL to kind of kick them into maybe uh, the the opportunities around indoor, as well as this maybe beginning of a model of an idea where players could play both indoor and outdoor as a full year kind of uh, uh, enterprise. You are 100 percent correct. Yes, uh, that's exactly what happened. And they, you know, again, wearing, you know, uh, having a shoe on each foot, you know, with each leg. I know every time I went to the NSL office, you know, I think I was probably the only MISL person that went to the NSL office on a regular basis. I knew all the people and such. Um, they were very uncomfortable in the loan agreements and the things that I was working on. And um, it was just one of those things. And. They uh, they had wished they had started the indoor thing because they could have economically done a, a very positive job of you know utilizing the players year round you know in the same market but it just never really came to fruition. Um, okay, so after the Houston uh, experience and your Rochester uh, brush with greatness, so to speak, uh, where, <laughs> where 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 what happened to you then uh, at that time? What what, what was uh, what was the MISL, et cetera, career looking like at that point? Well, this almost becomes the, the Bernie and John interview, if you will. Um, Bernie um, wanted to orchestrate moving the Houston team to Baltimore. So I uh, um, met Kenny Cooper in Baltimore, and they wanted Kenny to move and to coach the team in Baltimore. Kenny was not enthralled with the city of Baltimore. At that time, they were building the Inner Harbor the streets were under just a lot of construction. We went on a day where the weather wasn't very good, 
and Kenny really wasn't excited about moving his family from Houston, his wife was from Texas, to Baltimore. And subsequently, he decided to do it, and the Baltimore Blast was formed, and Bernie Roden brought uh, Tim Laiwicki, who is a brilliant marketing person, uh, then with the St. Louis Steamers of the Indoor Soccer League, and um, myself to do administrative stuff, I left Rochester and literally got in my car and drove to Baltimore and we uh, opened up shop in the, the Baltimore Civic Center and Kenny Cooper virtually brought most of the Houston Summit soccer team to Baltimore and we started playing there. I hired um, the uh, ticket manager of the New York Arrows to come down to Baltimore and uh, we wound up getting some of the Rochester players and uh, it just really took off. It was very successful in Baltimore. That, that was the first time I was with uh, a soccer team that you know we weren't giving away tickets. We didn't have to paper the house. We had really strong media coverage. Um, the hockey, uh, the the bullets had moved to Washington, and uh, we were the primary tenant. I mean, the other tenant was the Baltimore Skipjacks of the of minor hockey league. So it really took off. The media embraced the team. Uh, Kenny Cooper was just a very, very likable figure to start the team. Tim Laiwiki did a, really a superb job in marketing the team. It was a smaller arena, so you didn't have a 15,000-seat capacity. You know, you had something that was more like 10,000. And we were doing very well at the turnstile and doing well on the field. Yeah, I, um, you know, there are a number of teams that were sort of uh, credited with sort of the sis boom ba, I guess, to so the presentation, right, which today is now very commonplace in all of major league sports. Right. But I think maybe what you're talking about is for those who don't remember, weren't there, right, a, a Baltimore Blast franchise that, you know, I think in many respects was the um, the template for uh, pregame introductions. And it was fun. And, and the music and the you know, uh, there was a great Sports Illustrated article, I think, written by Frank DeFord, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. about sort of and, the, you know, the. And ironically, um, I was very much involved with that because when I was um, jumping ahead um, after Baltimore, um, I left and Earl Foreman, the Commissioner League, said Hartford is having some ownership problems. Would you consider going up there? I said no. And my sister moved to Connecticut, and this put me within an hour of her. So I took the job working with the Hartford Hellions and jumped up there working in the Major Indoor Soccer League with Hartford. And um, uh, after one season, the team was sold to a group in Memphis. And I elected not to go. I bought into uh, the Hartford Hellions training facility. It was an indoor tennis facility with one hockey rink with turf on it. And we converted that to uh, a more of a soccer-oriented sports center. And um, then uh, Earl, so the team moved, and I'm there not working for a professional soccer or sports team for the first time in my adult life. And Earl Foreman calls me up and said, would you be the uh, do some consulting for our All-Star game in Buffalo? And I think he paid me $5,000 to come out there for seven days. And I said, sure. So in the middle of winter, I go out to Buffalo, work on the All-Star game. Uh, and one quick uh, side note, which I think you'll find interesting, I try to get someone famous to kick out the first ball of the All-Star game. And the Edmonton Oilers were playing in, and staying in our hotel. I ran into Wayne Gretzky, who was certainly a teenager at the time. And I walked up to him, just like you'd walk up to anybody in the hotel, because in those days, it, it wasn't like uh, uh, a zillion fans bombarding him. And I said, would you be interested in kicking out the first ball? I'm, I'm here with the uh, all-star game of the major indoor soccer league. And he was familiar with the league. He said, I'd be happy to do it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. I can't wait to tell Earl Foreman. And he goes, well, you have to check with our coach. The coach's name is Glenn Sather. Glenn Sather was playing racquetball in the hotel. So I waited till he finished playing, and he came out and said, I have no problem with that, but you have to talk to Peter Pockington, our owner, back in Edmonton. So a day later, Peter Pockton called me up, returned my call, and said, why the heck would I want to promote your league? You're a competitor 
of the National Hockey League. And he basically hung up on me. <laughs> so that was the end of getting Wayne Gretzky, who at one point I thought I had in the palm of my hand to kick out the first ball because the way the schedule went, he was going to be in town for that time period. Right. So anyway, I go back to my indoor facility in, in Hartford where I'm doing this entrepreneurial thing of converting it to uh, two soccer fields. And um, uh, Earl calls me up, Earl Foreman, and said, would you be interested in being the PR guy for the uh, major indoor soccer league? And it was, uh, the office was in Philly, and Earl lived in Potomac, Maryland, which was kind of unique dynamics. So I met him at his home in Potomac, his home office, and he said, uh, we're moving the league office to New York or Washington in the next three to six months, so we'll put your stuff in storage. And um, um, I said, okay. We agreed on a salary figure, and I moved to Bala Kenwood. And we never moved the league office. So I spent two years living, working for the Indoor Soccer League in Philadelphia. And I lived in Earl Foreman's apartment. It was a furnished league apartment. And Earl came like once or twice a month. And he stayed in the master bedroom. And I had this furnished place to myself, totally at no cost. So my job being at the league office in Philly was every Tuesday, I'd go to New York and I'd knock on the door at Sport Magazine, Sports Illustrated, uh, visit some of the national media and try to interest them in the indoor soccer league. And at SI, I had involvement with the Redskins over several years and visited with Frank DeFord, who wasn't always in the office. And several weeks later, he called me up and said, my editor wants you to do a major story. He said, major story on your league. So the next thing I knew, I arranged a dinner with Earl Foreman Frank DeFord and myself at Duke Siebert's restaurant in Washington, D.C. And Frank DeFord said to Earl, I'd like Michael to take me around to as many games as possible in a week. And I literally live with Frank DeFord. May he rest in peace. As you know, he just passed away in the last 10 days, and I really got to know him. We stayed in every hotel in a room next to each other. We sat next to each other on an airplane, on an Amtrak. We went to as many games as we could in the league, and he wrote this 16-page article on the indoor soccer league. And um, I remember we had a, a, the, the league all-star game in Kansas City, and the magazine was coming out two days later, and the nice people at Sports Illustrated agreed to ship me a quantity to give to the owners in advance of the magazine being released, and Earl was so excited. It wasn't a real positive, positive story, but it was a lot of publicity on the league, and we'd just gotten a game on CBS, so things looked like they were growing as far as name recognition and notoriety of our league. And um, it was Frank DeFord that put together this beautiful piece, and what you mentioned, too, about the crazy introductions in Baltimore, um, Sports Illustrated called me up, and they wanted an illustrator to come out and uh, do a painting of the crazy introduction. And I have literally a framed picture of that. I went up doing a 250 lithograph edition of that main feature in Sports Illustrated that we gave to each owner of, of a team in the league. And, you know, uh, Earl kept the original. And um, that was kind of, uh, we hope, was a, a big step in the growth of the league, was getting the publicity in SI through uh, Frank DeFord doing a piece on us. Yeah, that uh, for for our listeners, that um, that uh, that drawing is uh, is just it's uh, it's it's tremendous. It's fascinating. I'd love to get an original copy of that somehow. That's um, it is it's really it's really something. And but that article, you know, he no fan of soccer though historically, uh, Mister DeFord. He correct. And Definitely. and what and what? But so what was the what was the I guess what was the feeling of that exposure, right? That no exposure is bad because you can clearly well, see in that article a little bit it, of uh, hints of, you know, cynicism, right? Yes. And, you know, he, he talked about, I think the headline has something like show sex in the suburbs, you know, how soccer was appealing to the suburban soccer, uh, soccer playing community and that they were trying to get the female audience by these sexy indoor soccer players wearing short shorts kind of thing. And, um, uh, it, it wasn't a flattering feature, but it was exposure in a magazine that, you know, never given us more than a few inches of copy, you know, over the years. They may have done something on Shep Messing, but, you know, that was our, you know, big 
uh, exposure, if you will, and uh, having someone like DeFord do it, uh, as opposed to uh, a no-name, you know, added to uh, the whole situation. And, you know, it all coming out in, you know, before an all-star game in Kansas City where we had a sold-out crowd and there was enthusiasm to expand the league and uh, there was a positive side, even though the article was not, you know, 60% flattering to the league. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The 10-Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called the National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again... Go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And now, back to our conversation. I think Hartford Hellions. The Hartford Hellions are are an interesting, very... um, uh, shall we say, forgotten footnote, uh, even amongst uh, MISL uh, enthusiasts. So uh, maybe if we could just sort of step back a second and and sort of maybe you can recount the story that was told to you uh, before you stepped into it. And then maybe we walk through how you what was what was that story as you went through it? Yeah, so I'd worked for the Baltimore Blast and my job as a vice president of administration was to compliment Tim Lewicki, who was just a marketing whiz, and he put the bodies in the seats and really generated tremendous enthusiasm. And I used some of my PR background with the radio, TV, and newspaper to really get people excited. And the media was looking for something that would, you know, grab them in Baltimore. And after two years, um, I um, was pretty content with what had happened. And uh, Earl Foreman, who I always had a nice relationship with, was telling me about Hartford. And at first, I wasn't enthusiastic about going up there um, because the franchise was going through bumpy times. And the owner, Bill Chipman, uh, had a reputation of uh, having some financial woes and not really having a background that was familiar with the sport. So um, I agreed to go up there and meet with him. And uh, he was a pleasant fellow. Uh, I knew about his background. And um, the league office told me uh, they would uh, back me financially should there be any problems. And that was all I needed. And my sister had just moved to uh, within 45 minutes of where I would be based in Hartford. And I, I only have one sibling, so I wanted to be close to her. So as much as I didn't like winters in the northeast part of the United States, you know, I became a part of the organization. And I remember going to the first game and someone said to me, do you want a grinder? And I said, excuse me? I had no idea, you know, a grinder was a sub, a hero, a hoagie in that part of the world. And th- they, we had a nice front office, uh, but we had a lot of bumps because uh, Chipman had financial issues. And um, I actually yeah. wound up staying in a uh, nice townhouse with a garage that he owned. 
and I lived there for something like a year and I never paid a penny rent. <laughs> so financially it was worth it for me personally to be up there. Um, now, I'm sorry, was this, this was, uh, did this, was this after the first season that you came in sort of the beginning of the second season of the Hellions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And, um, they were doing okay in the one loss record. Uh, it wasn't one of the top tier teams and it wasn't one of the, the losing teams. And it, there was an enthusiastic front office, which made me enjoy going to work every day. And John Kowalski, you know, the coach was someone I had known for a number of years. He had coached, uh, previously in Pittsburgh for, um, uh, I forgot the name of the family. They, uh, this would be the Pittsburgh spirit franchise. Yes. Yes. Uh, that would be the, the DeBartolos, group, no? DeBartolo. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I actually got to meet the elderly DeBartolo once, uh, uh, in his office in Youngstown, Ohio. And it was quite an experience. And um, it was like meeting the godfather to me. And um, I really enjoyed working with John Kowalski. Um, and uh, we had a nice indoor facility. And um, then when Chipman was having trouble, continued financially, uh, a group from Memphis said uh, they would buy the team. And um, I was an enthusiastic about it. Um, I uh, had met a woman who is now my wife of 32 years and um, um, didn't feel like leaving and had an opportunity to buy into the training facility uh, as my first investment as a solo entrepreneur. So I went full steam with, ahead with that because the, the group in Memphis um, just didn't seem like they were my cup of tea. I didn't think it was going to be a good fit. And um, I'm kind of a Northeast guy and at that time in my life and you know, felt comfortable up there. So I just stayed up there and the team moved to Memphis and I stayed in close contact with John Kowalski, the coach, but kind of, you know, separated myself from everything else in a very tasteful way. When did you, when did you know that uh, things in Hartford were kind of awry? It sounded like that uh, you were, uh, I want to say living the life per se, but you were doing quite fine and you had a good, uh, uh, you know, management team there. But, um, you know, uh, from, from what I've read, uh, you know, uh, Chipman was, uh, you know, quite the uh, uh, the creative tax person uh, when it came to uh, some of these uh, tax shelters that he was sort of doing separately from the team and um, uh, a couple of bounce checks here and there, you know, sort of the the traditional path of uh, of questionable uh, uh, dealings, as we see in, in a lot of these conversations around teams and leagues that don't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, in a morbid evidence? way, though, Tim, the, the bounce checks like in Rochester, where literally the Rochester Lancers of the NASL, literally the staff would race to the bank. We had a bank in the same building as our front office because in many instances, not once in a blue moon, some of those checks when you were in the second group getting to the bank teller, they did not clear. And I'd never experienced, you know, I worked in the, for the Redskins and, you know, you get to ride in the front of the airplane and um, you're getting these fat TV checks and these people are just going, you know, payroll to payroll, just trying to stay above water. And the situation started to happen in Hartford and, and the, the front office started, you know, feeling more day to day looking over their shoulder, I felt. And, um, you know, Chipman was the kind of guy that he'd move money from A to B, you know, real quickly. And it was almost like throwing spaghetti at the ceiling. And sometimes it stuck and sometimes it didn't. You know, I was in a unique situation in that, you know, I had the backing of the MISL office. And, um, uh, you know, I, I was doing okay. So uh, I would try to be positive, but I was also on staff and the staff you know, were not enthusiastic about working for Chipman. You know, I felt I was a bit more popular than he was with the team that we had. And you have to have enthusiasm and energy just to go from game to game to put bodies in the seats and, you know, put a positive front, you know, with the media. We played in the Hartford Civic Center. You know, it was a nice venue at the time. And uh, we had, a you know, a marginal office uh, in downtown Hartford. And, um you know, we didn't have a large staff, but it was adequate. Well, it, it seems that there's uh, some of the thematics here. Right? You've got sort of the league office that sort of, um, I guess, sort of has your back, so to speak. Right. So, yes. 
Um, maybe you can speak just kind of briefly to that. So how much of the league, you know, was, you know, kind of how much of the, the how much of how much of the league was string pulled, if you will, from the central office? Because it seems like there's a lot of at least understanding or coordinated efforts to keep sort of things going league wide where, you know, arguably these should be independent franchises and, and, and teams and, and all that kind of stuff. But it seems like there's it's almost like an invisible hand of sorts. You're right. You're, you're, you're dead on. I mean, can you imagine you're working for the New York Arrows and then the next week you're in Houston and you're working for the owner's son and these two teams are competing against each other. I don't know how often in so-called professional sports you have that situation, you know, whether it be coaches, the trading of players, you have the dynamics of the outdoor league and the indoor league where this ownership group that I mentioned in New York uh, was involved in Rochester and, you know, it just creates unique dynamics. And, um, there were times where we, there'd be some players that were, uh, being traded or talked about being traded. And I felt the league office when I was with the teams was, you know, looking at the big New York market and, you know, very much thinking in terms of, we just want to, you know, grow in the bigger cities and do whatever it takes. And there were certainly times where, you know, they may have crossed the line as far as, you know, doing things the right way as, you know, other major leagues today operate uh, in our country. All right. So, so um, but but it, it, it didn't stop you from being, uh, I guess, uh, uh, absorbed back in, into the league offices. Right. So I guess, you know, after no, you, I, I was having I was having fun, Tim. And, and that's, you know, it, it, I told you, I mean, I, I had the honor, the pleasure, right place, right time of working for the Redskins. I think I'm still the youngest PR man in NFL history, you know, being a PR director and to go to soccer because it was truly my love and it was more of an entrepreneurial kind of thing. And to, to get to kick a ball around and just interact with, you know, international soccer players to me was, you know, more fulfilling than a right guard or a right tackle. You know, the NFL was kind of locked it it's a job for life if you want it to be that way and the soccer league always had bumps i remember one time when i worked for the league office um president reagan invited the heads of all the sports leagues and i'd say major sports leagues but they invited us also to come to the white house and i couldn't uh, i wound up coming representing the league because earl foreman was working on getting a new expansion team. The deputy commissioner, Charlie Avranian, was in Phoenix um, bailing out a team about to go bankrupt. And the two of them, as much as they wanted to have a presence at the White House with the NFL commissioner and the baseball commissioner, so the PR guy, you know, much further down on the totem pole, you know, I went to the White House and I had lunch with Ron and Nancy Reagan, you know, and I have all these pretty pictures of it in my room here and um just because it was a constant thing of being um reactive uh to you know owners just having financial problems and part trying to replace this franchise in another city and if one owner had the financial wherewithal who owned one team as in the case of the new york arrows you know legally his son owned the houston team but you know then you had john still owning the arrows even though he and Bernie were partners involved in the team, then Bernie had the Baltimore Blast as his toy, as his team. And um, it was really interesting because, you know, you're talking to John Luciani, he'll ask you a question, and in a way, he has his hand in the running of three teams. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. So, OK, so you're but you're in the league now. So so I think it's really important. I mean, the fact that you're at the White House is, is indicative, right? There are. There were teams, I think the steamers for sure, and maybe some others that were, if I remember this sort of the, the articles and the and the, the calculations correctly, there were at least one, if not more, MISL teams that were outdrawing uh, some of the uh, laggards in both the NHL and the NBA, I yes. think, right? And the two teams would be the St. Louis Steamers and the Kansas City Comets. Oh, my gosh. You know, I told you, Frank DeFord, you know, I had that memorable week w with him. And we went right from St. Louis. You know, you had Stan Musial as one of the owners of the team. So I had dinner with Stan Musial and Ben Kerner and another gentleman. And then we go to the old Checker Dome with that 
old organ, and you got a full house, the crazy fans, and as you mentioned, the lavish introductions, which Tim Lywicki orchestrated, then he moved to Baltimore and then topped it even there. His older brother, Tracy Lywicki, also a real savvy marketing individual, he ran the Kansas City team, and um, um, these guys were just the reason the, the league uh, had the, notor- the good notoriety that it did. Those couple of franchises, they kept the league average attendance high enough. You know, we had a team in Wichita, and that did fine because there was no other professional game in town. And when I would, as a league office PR guy, um, based in Bala Kenwood, right outside Philly, I would spend most weekends during the season taking the train to New York, going to an Arrows game, or gathering tapes literally that night or sunrise the next morning and driving to ABC, NBC, and CBS networks in New York knocking on doors and more or less begging the weekend person to put some of this footage of this good TV sport on their feeds to all their affiliates throughout the country. So if you're in Wichita, a second tier market, certainly, but the MISL was very popular, you could um, get footage of other games right off the network feed and run it on your evening sports and that really you know drew attention um to the fans that they got real excited by that and the coverage in a wichita newspaper compared to you know the new york times was was quite a bit different in the small market for obvious reasons but you were able to incorporate the whole league through video footage you know you know this team's coming to town next week and you had footage of their game yesterday from the network feed so it, it's kind of minor league but that was my job and i and i was always so excited when you know someone would tell me oh yeah they ran the footage of you know the philadelphia fever against the wichita wings and uh, and once in a while ran on a market um that didn't have a team that was considering a team because the sports director was looking for something and you had you know three goals scored in 47 seconds and it just became part of your highlight reel. So let's talk about tele- <clears throat> excuse me, television for a second, because obviously, you know, we know today how instrumental television is. And I arguably I think it was just just as instrumental, instrumental, if not even more so then, you know, in the early 80s, mid 80s, when you had, um, you know, much more uh, limited uh, viewing options. But cable was becoming this thriving thing. And, um, you know, to, to the league's credit, you know, had uh, this uh, game of the week on the USA Cable network. network, right? And yeah. um, uh, for many people, that was the sort of persistent exposure. And and I know there were some dalliances with even broadcast television. I know CBS uh, broadcast a game or two of the finals uh, over right. time and, and that kind of stuff. But can you describe sort of the uh, uh, the hot and cold maybe relationship of, of uh, the MISL with uh, both cable and just anything related to television? Yes. Um, Earl... Foreman, our commissioner, developed a relationship with Kay Koplovitz, who was the head of the USA Network, and um, they struck a deal to do more or less a game of the week, and we had Al Trotwig, who was a a good announcer, doing the games, who loved soccer, and um, it had kind of a following, and you had the, uh, you know, the fans in Baltimore and St. Louis and Wichita, you know, really getting decent ratings because their fans just wanted to see MISL soccer, even if their own home team was not playing in it. And that went on for for a couple of years. Uh, They did the all-star games and it just became a a weekly thing you could count on of, of watching indoor soccer. And it also allowed us to, you know, spread footage around um, to other markets in the United States. Um, As far as CBS, we hired an agent uh, a big New York agent, uh, I think his name was Jim Jim Morris, and he um, worked a deal out with CBS. Um, you know, we certainly didn't make money off it. I think you're actually paying for it or backing it at the the MISL end to have you know a game uh, that year broadcast from Cleveland um, on CBS with John Tesh announcing the game and. Um, that was just, you know, our hope and prayer that this was going to put us over the top. And of course, the game would air 
on Saturday afternoon, probably the the worst time to have uh, TV programming, uh, but it was sports. It was on a weekend in the winter time, and you know there we were, and we were hoping it would increase from there. It never really did, but we kept. Uh, Jim Griffin was his name, and he was with the William Morris Agency, uh, the, the gentleman we had under retainer for several years that would you know knew the heavyweights and had the experience to uh, you know help us get our foot in the door but once we got the foot in the door of a CBS game Tim you know we didn't really uh, you know were able to develop it further than that you know the ratings weren't there uh, to justify continuing it um, and it was kind of a, a curiosity to the, the the sports fan that was you know pushing pushing channels on their TV uh, you know many people only saw it for the first time but it didn't take off like we hoped it would I um, I actually uh, 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 met uh, Kay Koplovitz a couple of times in my uh, my professional life in in media and um, oh uh, she has uh, some interesting and I'd like to get her on at some point to, to talk more specifically about because because in many respects the MISL and, and sort of sports became kind of a linchpin in the early days of cable. Uh, to kind of separate a USA network t- from some of the other sort of startup uh, TV channels. But I, she did regale me, and I, I need to get more detailed with her about the uh, the specifics as to why of some, shall we say, relative, uh, rather contentious conversations with Earl uh, in terms of uh, renegotiating or uh, uh, renewing contracts and whatnot. And um, I got the sense from Kay that uh, he was – uh, quite the uh, uh, intense negotiator when it came down to uh, certain aspects of getting television coverage. Yeah. I mean, Earl was a tough cookie, and he is a very shrewd negotiator. And but I'll tell you something: when you're you've got a unique situation, which we talked about earlier, Tim, where you know he and Eddie Tepper, the deputy commissioner, you know, had a con- contract contractual situation where they could get a franchise whenever they wanted, year two, year 17, and they would get that at no cost to them. So, um, you know, getting on TV and getting franchises in the right market, you know, if I was the owner of the Cincinnati Kids, I'd be pretty happy uh, with that arrangement because it was certainly an incentive for the two men that were starting this fledging league to grow it quickly and efficiently and without any immediate cost back to them. And um, uh, I think the deputy commissioner had a team in New Jersey uh, for a season, and uh, Earl never wound up um, getting a franchise, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. So uh, as a uh, and OK, we'll, we'll, we'll let this sort of be the sort of last tar- uh, point on the MISL. Uh, as you're talking to maybe one of the handful of season ticket holders to the New Jersey Rockets for their less than full season. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Ed Tepper, and indeed, uh, I, you know, it's just interesting, given what you said earlier uh, about where uh, the teams are located and and the challenges of the arrows on the uh, on the on Long Island uh, attendance wise, uh, that Ed Tepper uh, getting and taking advantage of his franchise uh, arrangement from the league uh, would choose northern New Jersey as the place <laughs> to put that franchise. Yes. Yep. I think he lived you know, in the Philadelphia area. So it may have been beneficial to him as far as being a part of, you know, starting the organization the right way that he wanted to operate it, you know, near him. But you're certainly oversaturating, you know, a market. You could find a Wichita or a Baltimore market and with 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 a Lywicki type front office team, you know, I think that would be a more realistic thing to grow as opposed to, you know, putting um, another team, you know, in the New York metropolitan area. It was also around the time that the Cosmos actually took indoor soccer seriously and the NASL did, too. And it was just a whole I mean, that, there was it was an interesting I mean, it'll be interesting about 20 people. But that year, uh, that indoor year was uh, uh, just uh Nirvana for uh, indoor soccer fans like myself in northern New Jersey. You had both the NASL and the MI, uh, uh, MISL having uh, two teams in, going on. You had a you had a game almost every other night there in the Brendan Burn Arena. It was great. <laughs> wow. Uh, 
wow. Nobody was, nobody was there, but it was it was right. fun. It was fun to watch, except for people like myself. OK. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So but it, it, you then made the segue back to the NFL um, with uh, another team kind of environment that we're interested in because the, the iteration of the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, you know, so for some people in, in Arizona who don't even remember the fact that uh, the Cardinals did exist prior to them, both in St. Louis That's and, very in, true. <laughs> and in Chicago. Um, so how did you sort of how did you sort of segue from the MISL and then back to, I guess, relative stability, maybe in the NFL? Yeah. I, I don't want to project you're, on you, but no, what, you're, you're not there? putting words on that. You're, you're exactly right. Uh, I enjoyed uh, working as the PR person for the MISL. Uh, I finished two years of it. Uh, I was having no problems. Uh, I was enjoying going to work every day. Uh, and it was pretty neat that I was doing my own thing because your boss was in Potomac, Maryland, and you saw him a couple days a month or at a game at best. And, um, you know, I was able to do my own thing and I had a budget and we had a staff and we were getting things done. And I had PR meetings and We'd actually have these people order to fly into town to try to move things up a notch uh, as far as notoriety and creating awareness. So um, we had the All-Star Game in St. Louis. And um, I was at this point engaged uh, to a woman who just moved down from Hartford to Philadelphia. And within a couple weeks uh, is the All-Star Game in St. Louis. So I flew my fiancé out. Uh, for the week or five days that I was there. And uh, a buddy of mine uh, named Kurt Mosher, he was the PR director of the Cowboys when I was the PR director of the Redskins. And um, he'd been in the league many more years than me. And he said, uh, Michael, uh, Bill Bidwell uh, would like to have lunch with you uh, tomorrow at the stadium club. Would that work for you? And it was a good time in my sky. I said, sure. So um, I, it, it'd be nice to see him. I, I, when I advanced games, because I was in the same division, the Redskins and the Cardinals, I always had one trip to St. Louis, and St. Louis always came to Redskin land. And I always made a point of seeing him and talking with him and had a nice relationship with him. And he had a reputation, um, perhaps in the uh, 80s, of being a very frugal man running you know, the organization. And they had some mediocrity except for the Don Coriel years, the Cardiac Cardinals. So I have lunch with him, and he said, uh, I remember he had a bow tie on, we're in the stadium club, and he said, uh, there's a couple of PR openings in the NFL. Uh, would you be interested in leaving the indoor soccer league? And my initial reaction was, I'm getting married. Uh, to your point, Tim, you know, there's some humongous security in being back in the NFL, and I kept thinking of San Diego. I think the San Diego job is open. So I said, yes. So uh, a few minutes later, he says, well, I'm looking for a PR guy here in St. Louis. And um, I didn't realize that Kevin Byrne had left. Kevin Byrne has uh, been with the Baltimore Ravens since their inception. And it's a friend of mine. And um, we sat down and talked. And uh, he offered me just a terrific opportunity. And I said, let me talk to my fiance. And um, she was kind of like, where's St. Louis on the map? You know, she, uh, she's a real New Englander. So um, I uh, signed a two-year contract and I um, uh, left the indoor soccer league. And uh, it was, you know, worth my while financially and the security of getting married because the league, the MISL was doing satisfactory, satisfactorily. And, but the NFL was doing terrific. So, you know, thinking as a family man for once and not as a, an entrepreneur, happy to move from one market to the other as a single guy, um, I jumped on it and went to the Cardinals. I mean, since I left college, I've been in nine states with different sports teams. And, um, you know, I figured, well, this will be a, a permanent arrangement. And from every little thing to helping me with the financing of my house and giving me a bonus for signing and paying airfare to my wedding, my best friend's wedding. I mean, this Bill Bidwell was just being so generous to me. Instead of putting me in a hotel, he put me in a suite in downtown St. Louis. And it was just one thing after the other. And we really hit it off. And uh, I was very happy there. And my wife got a job at the uh, KMWX Radio, uh, public relations. Uh, so between the two of us, we got invited to so many neat happenings in St. Louis. The only problem was um, 
we were the second tier tenant in Bush stadium to the baseball Cardinals. Um, and, um, my first year we came within a hair of making the playoffs and, uh, I really, you know, enjoyed working there and I could see myself staying there for, for many, many years. Were the, uh, were the seeds of a move from St. Louis, uh, being sown that you could tell at that time? Yes. In my second year, it was, uh, Jacksonville or Phoenix. And, um, uh, it, you know, created a lot of tension and, uh, I was fine moving because I felt like I'd have a job for life and could start a family and have the comfort of, you know, working for the same organization and building equity. And, um, my wife wanted nothing to do with Phoenix. She's a new Englander. And I said, what about Jacksonville? You know, if we go there and she was like, you know, I don't know. You know, I said, well, it's warm weather. And she, uh, wasn't enthusiastic about it. And, um, uh, ironically, the, um, uh, Cardinals were in the world series my second year. And, uh, a dear friend of mine from DC who just started a speakers bureau, the Washington speakers bureau uh, called me up and says, I, I know you don't have tickets for the world series tomorrow night, but I'd love to take my dad. And I said, well, actually I have four seats to every game and you can have my seats. So he flew out with his dad, came to the, uh, the world series game, stayed in my uh, townhouse. And, um, the next day he asked me, Hey, would you be interested in joining the speakers bar? I said, no, I'm very happy here. I have a two year contract. He went back. And as my two year contract was up, I'm prepared to renew. I've got an excellent relationship with Bill Bidwell. You know, we're kind of a 500 team, but we're in a good division. I'm enjoying the camaraderie with, with the other cities and the PR directors who were still there from when I worked for the Redskins in the seventies. So for me, it was kind of a coming home and I got on the Super Bowl detail, which meant I got to go to the Super Bowl every year for 10 days working with the media. And it was just a really cool situation for me. And the off seasons are not as intense as they are now. And it wasn't a 24 seven job. Like, you know, being a PR director of a team is with, you know, with the 24 seven nature of sports. And I was very, very, um, comfortable and I'm at the Super Bowl in new Orleans and I get, um, a wine and cheese basket, uh, from these two men, Harry and Bernie, uh, and said that we'd like you to fly to Washington. We'd like to talk to you about joining the speakers bureau. So I said, fine. I said to Carolyn, you know, I'll go visit my friends and my wife's name is Carolyn and, um, very happy in St. Louis was sure, you know, Bill Bidwell would keep me on for as long as I wanted to do. We were making some headway media wise. And, uh, all of a sudden they made me a financial offer. Um, I said, well, let me check with my wife. I, um, went upstairs, called her up and she said, absolutely. That's close to new England. You know, let's do it. And, um, you know, to her, the, the uh, only salt water, she's a, a, a beach person. The only salt water in St. Louis was the uh, saline, saline solution in contact lenses because the Mississippi River didn't <laughs> suffice as an ocean to her, even though many people in the Midwest, to them, it, it was their Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. So we, um, uh, I sat down with Bill Bidwell and he, he was very gracious and he said, you know, is there anything I can do to keep you here? And I said, uh, no, I've, I've made the decision, you know, I want to start this thing. And I got very lucky and um, became part of a very successful lecture agency. And uh, that was the end of sports for me. Um, the only connection was I was booking, you know, sports speakers uh, to do events for corporations and trade associations. So it was a little bit of a continuation of public relations with, uh, you know, athletes and coaches and broadcast people. All right. So as we wind it down, did you, uh, so, uh, I, I got to think that, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're leaving sort of the pro sports sort of excitement and electricity and, and entrepreneurialism, especially on the soccer side, there was a bit of a, maybe a, a wistful, kind of uh did you ever miss any of that sort of excitement as you became a bit more shall we say stable uh career wise um or you know were you was it a period of time that you kind of knew that was kind of done and then you needed to move forward well i had relationships with the nfl from from the 70s and i really kept in touch and every time you know i had my misl trips to new york every tuesday i'd take the metro liner to new york and knock on the doors you know, I would visit the NFL office like every three trips, 
and say hi to the people and stay in touch. And they actually help me, you know, with sport magazine. And, you know, I just talked to so-and-so and he'll meet with you next trip to New York. And, you know, so I, I kept the communication there and, um, I got to do instant replay. Uh, they called me up and, uh, it was my first fall with the Washington speakers bureau. It's the, the lecture agency I work for. And I remember one of the two owners said, I know you're going back to the NFL, you know, we're not happy with you doing instant replay. And I said, well, you know, I'm doing it on a weekend. I don't miss any company time. And, um, you know, I said, I give you my word, I'm staying here. And, um, the instant replay was enough. I did that for two years and that was enough of my NFL, you know, dosage that I needed. And it, the idea of booking Terry Bradshaw or Joe Thies and people that I knew from my NFL days as broadcasters and players, and being with them on site and that sort of thing um, was had a similarity and an overlap to some of the stuff you know that I did in the the NFL or with the soccer league. So um, I frankly did not miss it um, at all, and I wound up working at the Speakers Bureau for about 27 years. And I've been retired for a couple of years. And I run into people says you must miss your job. And I said I don't miss it at all. It was great when I did it, but it was time for me to shake hands and you know, move on to the next chapter of my life. And I've been very lucky. I mean, knock on wood, if I got hit by a car today, I mean, I feel I am busy. I'm stimulated. I'm taking care of myself and my family. And it's really worked out, you know, well for me that this chapter has really been neat for me. I'm doing a lot of community service and um, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, so that's, I, I, it's an interesting story arc. So as we wind it up, um, could you ever have imagined kind of where, I guess, sports in general, but in particular, the sport of soccer, right? Because it's such a big part of your professional career that we've been discussing, uh, would have ever gotten to sort of this level of consciousness in this in this country, right? You, the, some of the seeds of what uh, you were doing in the MISL and, and prior in the NASL, um, you know, I think are, arguably has sprouted some very significant roots uh, maybe not in direct ways, but certainly uh, you have a sport that is is uh, flourishing uh, on many levels uh, here in the United States where, you know, it was much more pioneering back in the 70s and 80s and frankly, a lot less certain that it was yeah. even going to take root. I, I had no idea that it could come this far. And I think back when I played soccer at American University, if you said to me that uh, you know, the, the word of mouth of the sport of soccer, male, female, my daughter is a professional soccer player and, you know, she's played all over the world. And, um, you know, I met my wife, we played indoor soccer together in Connecticut. And then, you know, it's like, I'm so consumed to this day, you know, with soccer, I'm taping two soccer games today. You know, the USA is playing Norway. No, a team is playing Norway uh, women's soccer. And I just texted my daughter, Molly, how many uh, players on the Norway team did you play with or against when you played your year in Norway? You know, and it's just so cool that I'm watching this on TV. Um, and, you know, my daughter has a connection to that. And the U.S. women's national team, two of her teammates in college start on the team. You know, it's so it seems like every third game I could watch in soccer on TV, which, you know, today you can just it's overwhelming how many games are on. There's some connection in my family or a friend of a friend. I mean, John Kowalski, this coach with the Hartford Hellions and the Pittsburgh Spirit, he coached in the NASL with Tampa Bay, Tim. And he has the distinction of being the only American men's coach to win a medal uh, internationally in soccer. He coached the men's indoor team to a bronze medal in Finland. <laughs> and who would have thought, you know, we had dinner two weeks ago. He was in town for a soccer tournament. And, you know, this guy has done indoor soccer. He's done outdoor soccer. He coaches college soccer now. And uh, it's pretty cool um, that people are able to make a living in this country uh, playing soccer. The, the, the college soccer is just elevated itself, men's and women's. Uh, they get some wonderful crowds in certain markets, and uh, there's just a lot of energy. And uh, that's a, a real dream to me. 
Well, um, the dream is the interview that we just had uh, and uh, the uh, the recollections, uh, which is uh, right down the uh, right down the pike of uh, of why we do this podcast. And um, I, I truly well, you've, wanna... done, you've done your homework and, you know, you've brought things up that, frankly, I forgot about. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, you giving me the time um doing the interview and just kind of reminiscing on some of the things that happened. And I, I've tried to be very candid and, in, uh, in, in things that I experienced. And, you know, um, uh, I look back on the stuff that, w- with a smile on my face and, you know, I've got a few pictures. I, I wish you were at my home. Look at some of these pictures. You would just smile and laugh. And all I have business cards of every team, I was with, and it's a pretty fat collection of business cards and media guides and stuff, but, you know, great memories. Uh, and I still stay in touch, you know, with some of these people. I'm going to a wedding in Croatia next month, and um, um, I'm hoping to see uh, this guy, Steve Jungle, who, um, um, you know, I signed as a player with the New York Arrows uh, many years ago. The Lord of all indoors. Well, uh, you can expect an email from me to try to figure out a way to somehow get him on the show at some point. I'd, uh, there you go. It and Freddy Gurgurov um, played for the Pittsburgh Spirit, uh, a prolific goal scorer, uh, then from Yugoslavia. He went to the New York Arrows, and John Luciani created this unique deal, and he drove my car while he was with going from the Philadelphia Fever to the New York Arrows, and my license plate, New York license plate on my uh, Cutlass Supreme was Arrows. That was my license plate, and Freddie Gregor drove my car. John Luciani um, gave him my car and you know worked a deal with me financially. Steve Jungle lived in my furnished apartment in North Shore Towers in, in Floral Park, New York, and you know I'm down in Houston working for that team, and I get this phone call. Um, it's Freddie Gregorov. His real name is Ferdo, and his last name is spelled G R G U R E V. He goes, Mike, this is Freddie. I effed up your car. I said, What'd you do, Freddie? He says, No oil. <laughs> he never changed the oil. The car had no oil, and it was a lot of money in damages. And he goes, Don't worry, John will pay for everything. I remember the phone call like it was last month and it was here. I'm working for the Houston soccer team. This guy is leaving the fever, going to the arrows, you know, driving my car. Um, and you know, the other players living in my apartment, you know, Bernie and John just managed to, you know, work everything out between Rochester, Baltimore, New York, and Houston. (laughs) And it was sometimes a comedy of errors, but, you know, they ran them as separate businesses and took it very seriously. And, you know, a lot of fun was had by all. And this is why we do this show, because those those stories are are, are just tremendous and, and should not be lost to history. We know where Freddie lives because uh, not personally, uh, but he, we've been to his restaurant a couple of times in the, in the upper yes. west side of Manhattan. And yes. uh, and Fred will definitely be uh, on our short list. And, and I, I look Good. forward to regaling him with that story and getting his side of the story. It'll be the same side, I'm telling you. And, and just what he way he called me and told me what happened, it's exactly the way it played out. And what a nice guy, you know, as is uh, Slavisa Jungle, you know, also known as Steve Jungle and Bronco Segoda and stuff. It was it was great bringing these guys in. And and to digress back a little bit, Tim, Bernie owned Bernie Roden owned some apartment buildings in Brooklyn. So we brought all these players in from Canada and the former Yugoslavia and everywhere we could find everybody. They all stayed at Bernie's apartment building, you know, and uh, there was like a shuttle service to an elementary school. We had as a practice facility and Don Popovich was the coach and um, a very volatile guy. Well, he coached the indoor team with the New York Arrows and he coached outdoor in Rochester. So you had this back and forth dynamics also where he had the same players in the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum as he did at Hollander Stadium in Rochester, New York. I, you can't you can't make this stuff up. And that's uh, and I appreciate uh, tremendously your uh, your 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 crystal clear memories of all this stuff. And uh, I look forward to um, keeping in touch. And I, you know, uh, tremendously uh, thank you for uh, spending a, a great deal of time with us to well, kind of thank wax you for nostalgia. having me. It, it, I enjoyed talking to you. Michael Minchell, thank you so much. Look forward to staying in touch.
Okay, there you have it. There's our chat with Michael Menchel, whom I uh, thank tremendously for uh, being with us and regaling us in some, I just, you know, uh, eye popping stories. And uh, I, again, I, I always learn something from these, these conversations. And I certainly hope you do too. You know, at some point, uh, I almost look at this as a public service. I mean, come on, where's the last time you heard anybody talk about uh, the old Hartford Hellions or even remember the old Houston Summit soccer franchise uh, or, or heck, even debate the, uh, the merits of the uh, fringe uh, uh, heavy uh, Colorado caribou uniforms back in 1978. Um, I dare you to find somebody else uh, that's uh, devoting any time or a discussion to uh, those uh, very important topics and more. Uh, than, than here on this podcast. Uh, and we uh, we love uh, regaling and all that stuff. We love discovering new tidbits and, and information about such. Uh, and we love you for listening to us. And uh, we, we uh, appreciate it uh, tremendously. Uh, we encourage you to uh, keep doing so. Please subscribe to us on iTunes, uh, wherever you find great podcasts. Uh, if you really like the show, please tell a friend or 10 of them and uh, have them do the same thing. Uh, show some love for us on social media, of course, please, on Twitter. That's uh, at Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will find a face, face, no, Facebook. That's it. Facebook. That's what the kids call it today. Uh, page devoted to the show. And uh, if all else fails, uh, you can always go to our website for, uh, you know, all the information that you need about the show. An old, old episode. Uh, you want to find a book or a uh, a video or some other thing that we mentioned on the show, that's the place to find it, is our website, and that is goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, visit there early and often, and uh, there's lots of fun stuff to do. Uh, we will get an email list uh, newsletter going at some point soon. Uh, you can sign up for that too, all that kind of stuff, uh, goodseatsstillavailable.com. All right, I am babbled out, and uh, I appreciate you listening this far in this show. We look forward to seeing you soon, and uh, until then, take care, everybody. <laughs>